started. I think people are back. Perhaps there may be some people taking a break still, but, uh, but we have nine groups, which is a lot, and, uh, and, and three genes per group. So we have 27 genes to talk about in exhaustive detail in the next 27 minutes. Um, seriously, we're not going to be able to do that. But what I think we can do is get started at least with some groups to look at the individual genes that they think are, are most interesting. And in the interest of time, uh, what I'm going to do is to share my screen uh, rather than sharing screens back and forth and back and forth, but, uh, and, and, and ask for a representative each, of each group to highlight what they think is, what gene they think is most interesting. We will pull that up and if there are additional tracks that you found useful for your analysis, we can open those up um, uh, on, on the fly. So, so what, why, don't we, why don't we start just in, 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 in anti-numerical order that's appreciated by those of us who have last names like Roos rather than Amos. Um, let, let's start with group nine. So is there a representative from group nine who wants to tell me what the number was of the gene that they found most interesting? Or you can just tell me whether it's the first, second, or third on the list, because I have the list in front of me. OK, I think it was actually all the three were very interesting. But you're going to um, have to pick one. Yeah, so uh, let's pick the last gene. I don't have the number in front of me. It's 23180. Was... There it is. Yeah. So this will zoom in um, to, uh, to your gene. Uh, oh, sorry, let's go. Hopefully this will pull up your gene. Um, in the way that I had, had looked at it previously, which may or may not be correspond to what you found, most interesting, and I'm going to uh, zoom out a little bit further and maybe uh, uh, Swati or somebody else from your group can tell me or tell all of us what you found most interesting about this gene, um, which is still loading up. It's very small. I can barely see. It. Okay, I, I can zoom <laughs> in a little. I can zoom in a little bit further on your gene. Yeah. Maybe that's a little bit better. Yes. What would you like to tell us about your gene? Okay, so uh, obviously it's a you know uh, antisense strand gene, and um, in the beginning, I think uh, you know some. If we look at different stages here, mm -hmm. then um, you know some of these regions they are being transcribed through. Whereas in other stages, we don't see that. And so uh, it is uh, possible that, uh, you know, in a state specific alternative splicing in this region is happening in the first one. Was and there then, in, in these, so you're talking about these ones here, like this versus here. Sorry, I cannot see your cursor moving. So um, I'm not sorry, let sure me, what uh, you're talking about. Um, oh, sorry. This, I, I have a new loaner laptop, so it doesn't have my ability to increase the, the mouse. I'm not quite sure how to increase the mouse size here. But you're talking about, so you're comparing, for example, the top strange here, which does not seem to be expressed compared to these yes. others. Yes, yep. and probably also the transcription start size site is uh, different uh, in different stages because if you go down mm -hmm. the screen and you look at these last two here, 
they are probably, uh, you know, the this is tachyzoid, if I'm reading it right, and mm -hmm. the other one. The bradyzoid uh, tissue system. The bradyzoid yeah, stage. Yeah. Uh, there it is starting, uh, you know, more downstream compared to the others. Mm -hmm. I, Anything else uh, that anyone else from that group or others who are observing this gene for the first time would like to add? Well, first of all, uh, let's take a look at the, the original gene, please, David. Uh, if you scroll up, please. Yeah, we have what? We have uh, one, two, three. We have uh, three, six, eight, eight exons, uh, seven introns. And this is uh, left, right to left direction. I think the evidence for the introns is really good. Um, um there is yeah these these uh, are really uh, 9000 uh, 3000 yeah the evidence is good although below them these these uh, overlapping uh, uh, uh these they mm -hmm. overlap the, the the exons um i don't know whether this is alternative splicing or it is uh, something else now, it seems clearly yes. evidence of alternative splicing. We can look at the long read sequencing to see if there's evidence yeah. of this long splice junction. Yeah. And, and we don't they see that here numbers. in the number that are seen. Let me make just a couple of comments about this. So this is an interesting gene. I mean, as you highlight, there is there are uh, there are eight annotated exons, um, seven annotated introns, and there's evidence in support of all of them. But in fact, there's equally strong or maybe even stronger evidence for an exon skip polymorphism that skips both of these two uh, exons. And we could look at what stages that's involved in. Uh, there's weaker evidence for another exon that's present here. We can see a little bit of it in certain stages there, but at an abundance that's sixfold lower than the adjacent versions. But here's the interesting, another interesting thing that I look at when I look at this gene. I see what looks like a characteristic transcriptional start and stop signal when I look in the most abundantly transcribed region. In this tachyzoids, it looks like the, the gene starts here. There are introns that read all the way through and stops over a range down here. In the uh, cat intestinal stages, there's clearly a different promoter, right? Transcription starts up here and down here. But what I also notice is that in many of these others, I see this kind of rounded curve and, and coupled with the fact that this intermediate intron is less abundantly observed, suggests to me that at low levels of transcription, there may actually be two transcriptional units here and here, uh, but that at the most highly expressed stages here and here, you do indeed see the annotation that's approximately correct. Uh, um, although the, the question that I always ask myself is, what would I like to see an annotator um, like Uli, who we have the good fortune to have on the call with us today, um, add to this gene? Would we want her to actually annotate that there are two different transcripts, which in some stages are, well, should we annotate this transcript separately from this transcript, separately from this transcript? I think there's good evidence that all of those actually exist. Would we want her to annotate this exon skip polymorphism um, or this one over here? Um, and, and I would say in the absence of, of, of biological evidence, probably not. Uh, but if I were interested in this gene, it would be important to know that there seems to be a cryptic promoter down here and that this transcript may sometimes end um, short. But in the most abundantly expressed stage, we see things like this. So the only things I might want to annotate would be an alternative polymorphism that includes these, this, this exon skip polymorphism, which is more abundant than this intron, 
and perhaps also annotate a stage specific promoter that's present in cat stages up here, but in, in the tachyzoid and bradyzoid stages here. Make sense? But let's let's take a look at a gene from does, group eight. Does the uh, nanopore sequence help you to? Oh, good question. Uh, good question. So the nanopore sequence is really useful, right? So the nanopore sequence here strongly supports this gene model without strong evidence of the exons of the exon skip polymorphism from what we can see here. But remember that this was only conducted in one strain in one life cycle stage. In fact, in this tachyzoite life cycle stage. So it strongly supports this as the promoter. And it does strongly support that at least in these cases, there is good evidence of it being a full length gene. But we would have to look at all of the nanopore sequences, not just those in this maximum height that's reached, because these are ordered in, 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 um, in order of, uh, of, of size, I believe, which means we might not see um, these, these shorter transcripts, which are probably, or anything that starts here that would be uh, somewhere down the list. So the nanopore sequencing is hugely helpful, but it's not going to be informative for stage or strain specific expression, because as yet we only have the data from one stage in one strain. Uh, do you have protein evidence? Uh, good question. Let's take a look. Let's uh, ask about proteomics data. And we will um, look at, I think there is a track for combined. Uh, no, maybe not. Where is the uh, combined? Yeah, so there is the combined track MS called. I'm sorry? The combined track is, is up there, all MS. Oh, there it is, all MS peptides. So, um, you know, I, I missed this because I was looking for combined. I was doing it pretty quickly. But this is an example of something that somebody could type a, a, a suggestion in the contact us like suggesting that the, the naming of the combined peptides be similar to the naming of, of some of the other uh, tracks like the RNA-seq data. So I can take this and drag it up to the top and see that. David, you could also pin your gene models, by the way. That's a nice feature to show everybody. Yeah, that's that true. Anyway. Good, good point. So I'm going, to I'm going to collapse this just so I can see these a little better. And as Omar was suggesting, I'm taking the gene model here and pinning it to the top. So I will always have that at the very top. And what I can see is there is proteomics evidence in support of this gene from multiple experiments, including evidence for several of these introns. Uh, proteomics evidence is, of course, uh, very valuable for the protein being expressed, but its, it's uh, uh, quantitative nature is, is, is far less reliable than for RNA-seq data. So the fact that we see no proteomics evidence for this exon, for example, is meaningless. Whereas if we saw no RNA-seq evidence for this, this intron, uh, exon would be very important. Let's ask about uh, group eight. Uh, what gene were you most interested in? We have a volunteer from group eight. Yeah, maybe I will volunteer and definitely see the one. Uh, uh, the first two protein is, uh, fair, they have very low transcription uh, level uh, compared to the neighbor genes. And so, so this is sorry. This is the first gene. This two one seven four nine zero. Is that the one you're talking about? Most uh, the the first two uh, genes. Uh, uh, you have to pick one because we've got plenty of groups to look at. Okay, <laughs> and uh, maybe the the interesting one, the third one. The third but one. I mean, yeah. All right. Let's look at at gene two seven six one seven zero. Um.
and that will come up. And Sukran, you can uh, you can get started telling us what you found interesting about this as the gene is coming up. Yeah, uh, because uh, this is uh, have a, a very uh, a very interesting explanation that uh, all the action has been have evidence of that uh, have evidence for the uh, expression, and then mm -hmm. so. And then also there is one uh, alternative exon that alternative intron that uh, it is also uh, it is uh, it is uh, verified for the expression also. Is this the uh, is this the alternative intron that you're talking about here that my mouse is pointing to? And uh, how can I miss one? That is... Yeah, uh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, all you know, the so there is some evidence for so so as you point out, I mean it's it, it's it's tempting. Uh, uh, you know one 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 concern with this exercise is that it's tempting to despair that the annotation is just terrible, right? That the annotation is incorrect for every gene or incomplete for every gene, and and indeed. There are some inaccuracies for every gene, and that is true not just for Toxoplasma, but also for Fusarium or Anopheles or human or, or Drosophila or Arabidopsis or whatever species you're looking at. But do keep in mind that these genes that you were assigned were all extracted uh, by algorithms designed to pull out something interesting. And the majority of genes actually show um, even less interest than the ones that you're, you're looking at. And you can, if you're an optimistic person, as, uh, or uh, if you tend to fill the glass half full rather than half empty, you can say it's really striking that the annotation of this protein, which was conducted even prior to any RNA seq data being available, um, isn't bad. It identifies all of the introns that are recognized, even though there are varying abundance. And right. what you point out here as an alternative intron was recognized by one of the um, prediction algorithms that we haven't dived into to look at. And, and yet this other exon here is, is present, at least in these life cycle stages, at vanishingly low abundance, right? Only here and not at all in the nanopore data. Thanks. Thank you. So are there other, and, and of course, this gene is pretty well represented by proteomics evidence. Yeah. Uh, we can see, as we've seen before, that the UTRs are probably uh, annotated by too greedy an algorithm. Well, there is evidence that transcription can start up here. The most abundant transcription seems to start, at least in these experiments, much further down. And the stop, the most abundant stop, is a little bit upstream of the annotated start, uh, stop. Were there other things that you or others in your group wanted to, uh, to point to? I, not from me. Uh, the, David, this one is, um, is the uh, transcribed right to left. Uh, this one's transcribed left to right. Left to right. I mean, there is a there is good good activity or good coverage uh, for the UTR, the five prime UTR. There is. There's very good coverage. I mean, yeah. the, a, a, and of course, um, that 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 the, if transcription works the way we learn about it in the textbooks, one would expect that you'd have uniform coverage from here um, all the way to the end of the of of the exons. Um, there does seem to be some transcriptional stops, some transcriptional termination here, but it's also possible that this low coverage is a consequence of, of a low complexity sequence that cannot be mapped uniquely. Uh, we could look at that. It's not something that we've done here. We have only chosen to look at the uniquely mapping reads, but sometimes that can cause a problem in some um, it, it, particularly in some species, for example, where there's extensive tandem duplication, as is true in many Canidoplastida. Um, uh, transcript, if, if this gene were 
duplicated 10 times, the transcripts would not be mapped uniquely anywhere. And so we might want to instead turn on the tracks to look at unique plus non-unique mappers. Uh, we could also turn on tracks, for example, to ask about, um, about low, complexity, uh, low complexity sequence information. So if we look at low complexity regions and turn that on, um, I can see that there's a lot of uh, areas of low complexity near this genome. Um, but this area here um, doesn't have a long region of low complexity. So that does not seem to explain the low sampling here. Uh, my guess is that many of the transcript, most of the transcripts uh, end, end here, but there are also transcripts that end here as well as many places in between. And um, you know, we, we see some evidence, well, weak evidence of that is in the, in the, in the um, nanopore data. Uh, there, I should say, there are other reasons uh, behind this, this slope at the beginning and, and the end, including instability of the RNA. So degradation from the three prime end, for example, may lead to uh, loss of coverage in low sequence, in, in, uh, in uh, Illumina sequencing, but not in long read sequencing that's been poly, uh, that that's, that's, uh, requires a, a poly A tail. If you if you also go to the three three UTR three prime UTR, uh, I think that, that there is a, it overlaps with the next gene, uh, the transcription start site. This um, TG, TGME four nine. Uh, so I think you're talking about the 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 five prime UTR or. Uh, three didn't we say that's left to right or? No, it's read it's read from left to right. And no, yeah, it, does we, not, it does not look like it overlaps with the, uh, with the next uh, uh, gene, either in the annotation or in the RNA-seq data that we can see. But on the right side, uh, there is this uh, start uh, TGME49 on the right. But that starts down, way down here, right? This is just the label for the protein. Oh, um, yeah. He was talking about the transcription start sites. Can you see that this was probably? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, this one. So, we this see one. An, so, so this is just an annotation, right? So there is evidence for transcription from for for transcriptional starts here, but from the evidence that we are looking at, we are not seeing that in any of the uh, RNA seq data. Um, we could look at the uh, um, at the at the combined um, RNA-seq plot to ask whether there is any experiment that shows, that shows um, evidence of that. And let's pull this up towards the top as well. So let's drop it in here and maybe change the uh, height to um, 50 pixels. So um, I'm not sure what the basis of the evidence for this transcriptional start site, but this is, th th this is another um, uh, strong example of why, uh, why, why annotation should always be taken with a grain of salt as a, as a good starting place, but where you'd like to take a look at the evidence. Um, I see, uh, you know, I see no evidence that, that, the dominant transcription of, of this gene here, 276155, begins up here, right? We can see transcript abundance of this gene is pretty consistent and no evidence that it continues up to there. So I, I, uh, I, I would, I, I would tend not to believe that 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 data as an indicator of where this gene begins. So I know that people are beginning to, to have to leave. Let's just do uh, let's just do one more 
and we can stay and and I'm happy to stay on to talk about other gene models for people who have interest or other questions. But is there someone who has a particularly exciting gene that they'd like to flag up from the analysis in their group? Maybe someone from, I don't know, group five, I'm just picking a number. Who was in group five? Hi, David. Sorry? Hi, David. Uh, uh, hi, it's Matthias. Matthias. Uh, let's do the number one of, of our group. That's what we All thought right. was perhaps Two, the most- one, 720. The most going on, most uh, exciting. All right, something that's annotated as a as a, a metal carrier, and hopefully we'll come up shortly. No, back off just a little bit so we can see more of this gene. Okay. So what is your interpretation of this? So we found that the three prime UTR is missing. And that if you yeah. pull up the uh, combined- Dramatically arc. missing. Now here's yeah. a gene, gene that must start up here somewhere. Exactly. Down to there. So there's good evidence for this long three prime UTR, although perhaps not quite as long as annotated. But, but the five prime end, um, let me just compact this a little bit so we can see better. But the five prime end clearly five, starts five prime, yeah. at least here. Mm -hmm with a minor transcript starting up here. And you were asking me to pull something else up? Uh, and we also found another intron. I think that's, uh, yeah. you see that on, on a seek evidence for introns, there's one that's skipping the- uh, This one here. Uh, the, uh, th that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yes. these are present at a frequency of about 4,000 reads in the available experiments, 3,000 reads, 5,000 reads, this one at about 1,000. So I've argued before when we've looked at some of these genes that alternative transcripts that are present at a frequency of one or 2% are probably not things we want to annotate unless there's evidence of biological importance like stage specific or mutant specific expression or condition specific expression. Uh, but this is a gray zone, right? It's about 20% of the, of the um, uh, annotated, uh, of, the, of the reads. So um, maybe that is something that we would want to consider. And um, we do see evidence of that in the, uh, in the long read RNA seq data, right? Strongly supporting that it's present there at, uh, at, at about the same percentage, right? About 20% of the reads look like they have skipped this, this exon. So you've highlighted um, grossly inaccurate UTR annotation. And in contrast to the last case, it looks like this, this predicted transcriptional start site um, looks like a good guess for where it ought to start, yep. at least for the most abundant promoter. And it also matches. It also matches the chip, chip, and chip seek that are there that we yes, haven't spoken about point. yet. But it's it's a, a uh, yeah, really nice yeah, match. Absolutely. So the chip, chip, and chip seek data that are here um, do not provide anything close to nucleotide level resolution. So we cannot use these data to determine whether the start site should be here or here or here. But certainly, if we're forced to choose between here. They uh, between here and 
here, the downstream aspects of these peaks are much more consistent with the annotated um, with the annotated transcriptional uh, start site. So we have some clear things to do um, here. Uh, one thing that you might want to do, just uh, before I let people go, Matthias, um, if this is truly an exon skip polymorphism, which would delete this exon, right? It might cause a frame shift in the predicted protein. It does. Yep. It does. So okay. you took a look at the ends of this, right? So, so this we, we one. We saw we saw it in Apollo. <clears throat> actually, I don't know. Okay. If the so in Apollo, out, but... we'll we'll look at that. Uh, mm -hmm. We can also see here if this runs from six eight eight three. Uh, if this exon runs from six eight eight three, and this one ends here at six seven six three, so eight eight three to seven six three is uh, is uh, is one hundred and twenty nucleotides. But remember, it's one hundred and twenty minus one because both ends are present in the uh, uh, in in the in in the intron. So one hundred and nineteen nucleotides would change the reading frame. And maybe that might make you less likely to annotate it. I guess I would argue that at 20% at of the total, that's sort of right at the boundary of what I would call. Let's maybe give the last word to, to Uli, our curator. Uh, what would you do with this gene? Uh, although it causes a, a frame shift, it's still a, quite a long one. Um, so it's not a tiny one. And if you put in the community annotation, you will see that still looks like a reasonable gene. So it's in there and. So if we pull up the uh, Apollo track. But it's debatable. I mean, it's 20%, but it's better right. than one. So right, so so this gene has already been annotated in in Uli in in, in Apollo, probably by Uli on uh, on evidence perhaps provided by others, uh, showing the showing what we would argue is the correct. Or was this something that you did? Yeah, so, so the right, the a a more accurate UTR, showing the exon skip which leads to a frame shift and a different termination. Now, some other things we might want to do, this protein, which is predicted to be a metal cation transporter in the ZIP family, uh, might be something that we would like to conduct multiple sequence alignments with, with other toxoplasma isolates, and see if these are, where there are, there's RNA-seq data that's available for multiple strains. You could ask whether this, uh, Polymorph this this exon skip polymorphism is concerned can conserved. You could compare with with other orthologs and other species. Um, lots more that we could be done could, that could be done if we wanted to uh, make some structural predictions that Matthias could put up behind him for a, a a a background slide next time around. But um, I think we're going to have to leave it there because I do really want to respect people's time, especially those who are calling in very late in the evening for them. And, uh, and, and I hope this has been a useful exercise in highlighting um, the shades of gray that exists behind every curated um, annotation. Right? This is no different than anything else we do in, 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 our, our, uh, in, in our lives when you, um, you know, re read the newspaper about uh, about the interpretation of some uh, of some economic results. We're all aware that there there may be differences of opinion and different points of view on that. And the same is true for for gene models. If this were your gene, you would be uh, very ill advised to uh, to conduct your work on the basis solely of the of the uh, official annotation at this stage. Uh, Omar, did you have anything you wanted to say to send people off for preparation for, for tomorrow? Um, not really. I think most people already left. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's getting late. Um, I think for everybody, maybe from today's uh, sessions, uh, I think 
as, as David indicated, I think one of the biggest lessons was that there's a lot of data available to you and um, you, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, and that's your fingertips, right? And so, uh, so it's really important that you learn how to uh, work with that data to help you uh, make sure that you're making the right decisions for wherever, whenever you clone a gene or, or do a large scale experiment or analyze data sets or even review papers and look at the data that's being presented in these papers. Uh, because there's uh, a lot of inference you can uh, you can make from uh, the data that's available in in the database. Um, so for um, tomorrow, we are going to spend um, we're going to be doing a bunch of uh, different things. I don't know, David, if you can go to the workshop page on ViewPathDB to look at tomorrow's schedule. Yeah, not the Excel spreadsheet, but I mean, I guess it's fine. But I, I mean, if you go on to the workshop page. I, I don't have that up and I, I don't have my links right here. So, um, oh, I mean, just go to uh, FungiDB and then go to help workshops. We can navigate to it and this will teach people again how to get there. Yeah, you can go to any of the ViewPathDB databases, you go under help and then from the help menu, select um, how, learn how to use ViewPathDB. And then select the workshops right in the middle, explore, and click on the top workshop, which is the one that's currently um, running. And uh, if you scroll down, David, um, as you'll see here, as this page is loading uh, for David, um, you'll oh, I'm notice. Sorry, that... I'm not sure. I'm not sharing my screen. Yes, um, you are. Yes, oh, okay. You are. Okay. Yep. Sorry, um, it was just it's just a just a delay in coming up on Zoom, I guess. Yeah, so if you scroll up a little bit, David, um, just to show, I think the recordings are showing up for you. Yes. They are, okay, we don't see them on our screen, so it must be just uh, delayed. Um, uh, no, I, so. Your, your page is doing some weird stuff. It's waiting for some cache or something. Uh, it doesn't matter, that's fine. So uh, the recordings from today, uh, they should be up later tonight. Uh, so you'll be able to, uh, if you need to re-listen to some of the lectures, you'll be able to have access to them or share them with your colleagues. Um, tomorrow, we'll spend um, uh, some time discussing how you can analyze your own data. Um, specifically, we will uh, cover uh, ways you can interact with uh, the Galaxy servers uh, to run bioinformatic tools uh, on your own data and how you can then use the results from those analyses to then interact with uh, ViewPathDB resources. Uh, we will then do um, uh, have a lecture on transcriptomic and proteomic data within uh, ViewPathDB and have uh, uh, X will spend some time just exploring this kind of data in the databases. Um, and then we'll end the day tomorrow uh, focusing uh, on a lecture from Mark Hickman about orthology. And so we'll, lots of people asked about orthology and ortho MCL, and and we've already done ortho, orthology transforms throughout the workshop, but tomorrow we'll get some background on how uh, orthologs are determined and how we use them um, in our resources. Uh, so that's it for tomorrow in a nutshell. And um, I think David, as, as we did yesterday and with all the other instructors, some of us will hang on until 1.30. Um, so another um, 15 yeah, minutes. 15, 20 minutes. So if anybody who has questions, obviously uh, you can stay on and ask them or if you just want to chit chat. Uh, otherwise uh, you're welcome to leave and we'll see you tomorrow. Anyone have particular questions that they wanted to raise, either about uh, genes we didn't have a chance to talk about, some of the data sets that are involved, or you know, or or other other questions? There's a question in the chat about um, 
How do you do quality control? How does quality control take place at ViewPathDB? <clears throat> yeah, uh, that's a good question, Neha. And, and um, th there's, there's no easy answer um, to it. There are, lots of, there, there are lots of steps of quality control. Uh, probably the most important form of quality control and, and Omar and members of the outreach team who are responsible for, for prioritizing and sourcing data can chime in here. But I would argue that the most important source of quality control um, is in data identification and prioritization by the community. So if there is a key data set that is necessary to you for your work that is not loaded in ViewPathDB, we want to know about it to make sure that we can make, sure it, to make it available for people who can take advantage of it. Now, there are many other steps of quality control that go into the analysis as data is, is processed and loaded. And the QC steps are, are very different for genomic data or for, you know, or, or, for, or for population genetic data or transcriptomic data or proteomic data. But for the transcriptomic data that we've been talking about today, for example, all of that data is mapped um, from the original raw reads through the uh, uh, mapping pipeline that uh, conducted an ensemble in the UK. It is then sent back to the US where it is um, loaded into the database and, in, and this proce the processing steps involve, uh, involve um, normalization and, and a whole variety of standard tools that are used to uh, make sure that, that, that contaminating sequences are removed and that, and that, that other obvious errors are, 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 um, are avoided. There, and there is always a manual curation step at the end, ideally in association with published data and discussing with the data providers to make sure that the data that is processed is, it, uh, represents accurately rep represents the biology that is known. And probably the most important aspect of this is all of the data is processed um, in a consistent way so that you know that the data from one RNA-seq data study has gone through the same pipeline. Uh, Omar, as your, I see your hand up, you probably have some other things to add. Yeah, I just wanted to stress that, that one thing we, we uh, try and do as best as possible is for every release, and we release our databases once every two to three months. And uh, for each data set that's included, uh, it goes through internal QA, which is done by the outreach team or the data developers, where they uh, either do an automated step for QA and the outreach team, we're the ones who read the papers and actually then look at the results from um, uh, the searches on the database and make sure they make sense, both biologically and also make sense with regards to the publication. Uh, but also an important point is that we, we try very hard to communicate with the people who generated the data. So even if the paper is published uh, and, 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 and the data is in the public domain, we do communicate with the providers, let them know that the data is available and ask them to do their own quality uh, control of their own data in the database, right? So that's almost a um, one of the best ways to do it uh, because then we get uh, the provider who's generated data with their vested interest to make sure the data is represented uh, appropriately in the database. Um, this doesn't mean that there aren't mistakes. Uh, earlier today in a breakout uh, session, we were looking at an RNA sequence data set in uh, TriTripDB and uh, the, the strands were reversed. So the, the forward strands were actually mapped to the, uh, were showing up on the, re on the reverse strand and the reverse strand were showing up on the forward strand. And you could tell that because of the colors of the of the reads and the, and the way the gene models are, are going. Uh, and so that's clearly a data set that slipped through all of our quality control um, mechanisms. Um, and as a result, I mean, we caught it here. And so that would be fixed uh, by tomorrow, I'm sure. But um, uh, there are cases where we don't discover them and we rely also on our community. So the policing of the community is super important. We do get emails from community members on a regular well, I don't want to say all the time, but you know, whenever we have community members who are actively uh, make sure to let us know when they notice an issue with a data set. And, and we do appreciate that. So if you ever see anything like this that you think may be wrong in the database, don't hesitate. We'd rather confirm either that it's wrong or not than, than ignore it. And then it turns out to be wrong and, and lots of people would have taken a look at it and, and been misled by it. 
Well, Mark, do you want to mention our common pipelines? Uh, sure. I mean, David already mentioned that in terms of uh, how all of our database, all of our data sets are processed, you know, like RNA seq is processed. Is that what you mean or you mean something else, Sam? Oh, I mean, I guess that, that. Yeah, yeah, okay. so, so let me, so, so let me give an example of this and, and, and I don't want to overstate the case. So, so two, two additional points I want to make for this. First of all, with respect to this issue of common pipelines, I highlighted the common pipeline that is used so that you can be sure that all of the RNA seq data that is, is uh, portrayed is, uh, is processed through a common pipeline. And that is true. That is true even more importantly for the, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, DNA seq data from population genetic studies that are used to identify SNPs. Because uh, as you know from tuning the parameters on any kind of SNP query, depending on the parameters you can use, you use, you can find more or fewer SNPs. So it's critical to make sure that if you're going to be combining data from multiple experiments, they've been processed via the same pipeline. That is not true for all of our data sets. Uh, for example, the proteomics data is not all processed via the same pipeline. There are a variety of different methods that are used for calling, uh, for, for calling um, uh, uh, proteomic hits. And, and we represent those hits that have been recognized by the individual studies, which have not analyzed all of the data via a common pipeline. We've explored doing that in common ways. We'd love to be able to do so. But it's a big task, and with proteomics data of, of lesser importance uh, than, say, RNA seq data, that's not where we've chosen to, to invest our effort. But the final point I want to make, and, and, and maybe the most important point of all of this, is that implicit in the question of how QC is uh, uh, as carried conducted is, is how confident can you be that ViewPathDB is providing you the truth? And the answer is not very confident at all, right? We do not view these resources as being um, the definitive answer that will give you the provably correct uh, response to any inquiry that you may want to form. We view it instead as experimental tools that are designed to give you a clue as to where to conduct your next experiment. And that's part of what we mean by talking about these queries as, as in silico experiments. If you run a gel on a protein and the protein shows up with a molecular weight of 60,000, right? You are not guaranteeing that that protein has a weight of 60,000.000. Um, your, your claim that it has a molecular weight of 60,000 is that it's an apparent molecular weight of approximately 60,000 subject to the vagaries of, of running gels and protein processing and glycosylation and other sorts of events. So our goal is not to provide the provable truth for anything, but rather to provide you with a consistent tool for being able to drive the next experiments you might conduct in the lab. 